Thank you. That concludes uh, general questions. We'll move on now to First Minister's questions. Question number one from Jackson Carlo. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, the deal presented by the Prime Minister to the European Union, about which he is currently speaking in the House of Commons, has now attracted support from people who want to leave the European Union with a deal. I'd vote for it. Why won't the First Minister? First Minister. Well, we found out this week, presiding officer, that Jackson Carlaw will vote for whatever Boris Johnson tells Jackson Carlaw to vote for. Presiding officer, the proposals that were published by the UK government yesterday do not look at this stage like they will be acceptable to the European Union. Uh, they also seem to break all of the promises that were made to Ireland at the start of the Brexit process. But aside from all of that, these proposals would take Scotland out of the European Union, out of the single market, out of the customs union, all against our will. Yep. And they suggest a much looser relationship with the EU, a much harder Brexit than even that proposed by Theresa May. So let me be quite clear, as I have been crystal clear in the past, I won't support something like that because Scotland doesn't support that. And if Jackson Carlaw was interested in standing up for Scotland as opposed to simply standing up for Boris Johnson, he wouldn't be supporting that either. Jackson Carlaw. Our position is further dither, delay and uncertainty and the prospect of Jeremy Corbyn as Prime Minister, to which this First Minister is disgracefully open, is much more damaging to us all than getting this sorted now. We are at the, we are at the 11th hour. There is a need on all sides, all sides to compromise if we are going to reach a negotiated settlement. Yet the record of this SNP government has been to fail to do so. The First Minister repeatedly says she will do anything possible to stop no deal, yet despite three opportunities so far this year, her MPs haven't ever voted for a deal. Does she regret not ordering her MPs to vote for a deal when she had the chance? First Minister. My alternative to no deal is no Brexit. That's what the people of Scotland voted for. All of the efforts. All of the efforts I made at compromise to keep us in the single market and the customs union were spurned and cast aside by Theresa May. I will not support an option that takes us not just out of the EU, but out of the single market and the customs union. But Jackson Carlow has no credibility uh, on this or perhaps on anything else uh, after the events of this week. He's gone from being an enthusiastic Remainer yeah. to a Boris Johnson loving no deal Brexiteer in what seems like a heartbeat. Yeah. To use the language of the Secretary of State for Scotland, he has brought the Scottish Tories into line with his Westminster bosses. But in doing that, he has completely abandoned the interests of the Scottish people. Shame on him for that. Yeah. No wonder his colleagues now want to get rid of him. I have to say, I thought Labour were the masters when it came to getting rid of leaders, but at least they wait until the leader's elected before they try to oust them. <laughs> Jackson Carlaw is about to be ousted before he's even elected. Jackson Carlaw. The real shame is a First Minister who is prepared to conspire to make Jeremy Corbyn First Minister of this country. <laughs> and once again, and typically, the First Minister confirms that there has never been a referendum this century, the result of which she's prepared to accept, support or implement. That's not democracy. And let's just examine for a moment what the First Minister's plan and the fantasy top team she now wants to run Britain is. We've got the Liberal Democrats who want to cancel Brexit altogether, or if, you're Jamie, or if you're Jamie Stone, their official Scotland spokesman, to support no deal over Jeremy Corbyn. We have Jeremy Corbyn, who wants to get a new deal and then possibly campaign against it in a referendum he may or may not support. And we're topped up by the SNP, who claim they will do everything to avoid a no deal Brexit other than to actually vote for a deal. On this side, we want a deal, we'd vote for a deal. The First Minister has said she wants a deal. The First Minister has said she wants a deal, but now won't vote for one. Which of these approaches does she think is most likely to actually secure a deal? 
First Minister. I want Scotland to remain in the European Union, yeah, yeah. firstly because it is the best option for Scotland, and secondly because that's what people in Scotland voted for, to remain in the EU. And you know, Jackson Carlaw used to agree with me on that. He used to agree that if that wasn't possible, we should at least stay in the single market in the customs union. He used to agree with me that no deal should be avoided at all costs. Now we have a situation where Jackson Carlaw's position can be simplified to simply doing whatever Boris yes. Johnson instructs yeah. him to do. He doesn't care about the best interests of the Scottish people. I'm not even sure he cares about the best interests of the Scottish Conservative Party because backing no deal is certainly not in those interests. I think Jackson Carlaw has made the miscalculation that backing Boris Johnson is the best way to remain at leader of the Scottish Conservative Party. But I have to say his colleagues seem to have a completely different view of that. Jackson Carlaw has squandered any shred of credibility he ever had. Jackson Carlaw. If the First Minister had the courage of her convictions, she would have voted, voted for a general election several weeks ago, and there would have been an opportunity for this issue to have been resolved before the 31st of October. She had her chance. Once again, her MPs were all talk, but no action. Yeah. Presiding officer, Scottish Conservatives yeah. welcome the fact that in the EU and the European Commission, senior figures haven't rushed to judgment like the First Minister, and have made clear that they are prepared to examine this plan in detail. And we urge that both they and the UK government continue their intensive discussions over the coming days. That, rather than the never end the First Minister supports, is the best way to get this resolved. The truth is, and the First Minister has confirmed it, the SNP doesn't want a deal. It's not prepared to respect or implement the result of the referendum. Whether it's this deal or Theresa May's deal, their answer is always no. Rather than yet more delay, isn't it time we got this done? First Minister. Well, when I, think, I, I think when it comes to Boris Johnson's proposals, it's probably more a case of intensive care than intensive <laughs> discussions, given the reactions uh, yesterday. But I have, to say, I have to say, I don't see any indication uh, that these proposals will be acceptable to the European Union. They also break every single promise that was made to Ireland. I remember Ruth Davidson uh, saying that she would never ever back any proposals that put a border down the Irish Sea. Now, of course, Jackson Carlow has completely changed his position on that. The fact of the matter is, there is not a shred of principle in the Scottish Conservatives' position here. They've gone from enthusiastic Remainers to no-deal Brexiteers simply because they have been instructed to do so by Boris Johnson. Uh, I don't want... Well, Jackson Carlaw is saying that I don't support a deal. I don't know where Jackson Carlaw has been for the last three and a half years. I don't support Scotland being taken out of the European Union. I want us to remain in the European Union. I don't want Scotland to be dragged out against our will by any Tory government. That's why I'm going to continue to press for Scotland's place in the European Union and I'm going to continue to offer a choice to the people of Scotland uh, so that we can choose an independent future as a way of protecting that relationship. Thank you. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, presiding officer, in May of this year, Dr. David Strang published the interim report of his independent inquiry into mental health services in Tayside. Can the First Minister tell us what has been done to implement his recommendations? First Minister. Uh, discussions uh, continue. We still await, as uh, I, I recall, the final uh, report from uh, David Strang. Uh, in the meantime, of course, we take a range of actions to ensure that we are improving uh, mental health care and treatment for those who need it. Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. In, in fact, uh, in his interim report, uh, Dr Strang made only one recommendation. He said proposals to centralise mental health services in Dundee should not be considered before, and I quote, a comprehensive review of mental health service strategy is carried out. But not only has NHS Tayside failed to carry out that review, worse still, the board is pressing ahead with the centralization of those services. Speaking in the last week, Dr. Strang said, and I quote him again, it is disappointing. This was the only recommendation in the whole report. 
because I thought it was urgently needed. First Minister, this is an independent inquiry set up because of the deep concerns of families who have lost their loved ones through suicide. So why is there no urgency? And why is the sole recommendation so far of this independent inquiry being willfully ignored? First Minister. Uh, well, Richard Leonard is right to talk about the seriousness of this issue and the impact of these decisions on families across the country. Uh, let me be very clear that when an independent inquiry makes recommendations, it is the expectation of me and of the Scottish Government that they are fully taken account of uh, by NHS boards. And I would expect NHS Tayside to take account of the recommendations made uh, thus far by uh, David Strang in the decision-making process um, around uh, mental health facilities in the Tayside area. Uh, that is my expectation. Uh, as we uh, receive the final recommendations of David Strang, uh, it is also uh, the case that we will expect recommendations for the NHS to be complied with and any recommendations that may or may not come forward for the Scottish Government will be uh, treated with the utmost seriousness by the Government as well. Richard Leonard. Let's remember why this independent inquiry has taken place. It is three years since David Ramsey died by suicide and too many other families have lost their loved ones. David's niece Gillian told me just yesterday that, and I quote her, NHS Tayside refuse to listen. They refuse to change. They are being allowed to carry on. Business as usual. Things are getting worse at NHS Tayside, not better. If the independent expert appointed to chair this inquiry, a man with considerable experience, says his recommendation is being ignored despite, despite demanding action as far back as May, and the grieving families are saying that things are getting worse, not better. First Minister, your expectation is not being met. So isn't it time that you stepped in before more time is wasted, before more families are made to suffer, and before more lives are needlessly lost? First Minister. Well, can I say uh, to Richard Leonard that I, of course, uh, will and always do reflect very carefully on issues that are raised with me at First Minister's questions, and I will do that today, uh, given the seriousness of the issues that have been raised with me uh, by Richard Leonard. Uh, I will uh, repeat what I said in my earlier answer. It is my expectation that health boards uh, properly take account of recommendations like this one in the decision-making processes that they are required to undertake. And I will certainly uh, consider carefully the points that have been uh, made by Richard Leonard today. I would uh, want to take the opportunity to put on record again my condolences to uh, the family of David Ramsey and anybody else uh, who, whose loved one have lost their lives uh, to suicide. Uh, the Health Secretary would be very willing to meet uh, with his uh, family if that is of interest, uh, to hear firsthand uh, the concerns they have uh, about the current uh, and ongoing situation in NHS Tayside. It is important that we listen to the lived experience uh, of patients and of patients' relatives, and we will continue to do that uh, in good faith and in all sincerity. And I'd be happy to uh, ask the Health Secretary to write to Richard Leonard uh, once we have had the opportunity, I've had the opportunity to consider carefully the points that he has raised in the courts uh, that he has put on the record today. Thank you. We have some uh, constituency supplementaries. The first from Murdo Fraser. Thank you, Presiding Officer. NHS Tayside also has serious financial difficulties, but has just been advised for the Scottish Government that its winter planning budget has been cut in half from £737,000 last year to just £369,000 this winter. Can the First Minister give me an assurance that elderly and vulnerable patients will not be put at risk from this cut? And why is it being made when the Scottish Government are set to receive an additional £635 million in Barnet consequentials from increased health spending south of the border. First Minister. Firstly, in terms uh, of the comment Murdo Fraser has made about winter planning uh, funding, um, it's not quite right what he says. The Health Secretary has announced today initial allocations uh, to health boards. We will continue to discuss winter plans with health boards uh, and look to see what further uh, financial provision is required to help support them. So let me stress very clearly today to the Chamber and to health boards that the announcement today is an initial allocation, not necessarily the end uh, of that process.
process. I uh, know very well, not just uh, as First Minister, but from my past experience uh, as Health Secretary, the importance of winter planning, the importance of keeping winter planning under review and the importance of the Scottish Government working closely with health boards uh, to make sure that planning is robust but it is properly resourced as well. Um, in terms of uh, consequentials, you know, we hear a lot about spending commitments and consequentials that may flow from those spending commitments uh, from the UK Government but if Murdo Fraser doesn't mind, uh, I would prefer to see the colour of the money um, and actually have the the cheque cashed and not bounced uh, before we start allocating that. Uh, on past experience, what this uh, Tory government says about consequentials don't always flow through into actual money. So we'll wait and see. And finally, can I just remind Murdo Fraser uh, that while we are ensuring record funding to the NHS in Scotland, uh, had we taken the advice of the Scottish Conservatives on tax cuts for the richest, uh, we would have had to take £650 million out of our budget. That is equivalent to 16,000 fewer nurses in our National Health Service. I call Gail Ross to be followed by Mark Ruskell. Gail Ross. Thank you, President Officer. The First Minister will be aware that as part of the EU-US trade dispute, the US has published a list of products from the EU that tariffs of 25% will apply to from the 18th of October. These include a range of iconic Scottish goods, whisky, cashmere, shortbread, cheese and seafood. The financial and economic impact on businesses and constituencies like mine is likely to be huge. Can she assure Parliament that the Scottish Government will press UK ministers to do all they can to protect Scotland's interests? Well, can I thank Gail Ross for raising what is an extremely important and very concerning issue. Um, the news this morning is profoundly worrying for Scotch whisky and for the other Scottish products that Gail Ross uh, has mentioned that are exported to the United States. In terms of pressing uh, UK government ministers, I recently wrote to the Prime Minister highlighting the threat to the Scotch whisky industry in particular. I uh, discussed the issue directly with the SWA just uh, a couple of weeks ago and we will continue uh, to encourage uh, the UK government to support a negotiated settlement to this and we support the efforts of the EU to find that negotiated settlement. Um, it is in nobody's interest to have trade wars uh, like this. Everybody ends up being a loser um, and the sooner we find a resolution to this, the better and I would encourage UK ministers uh, to work hard to do so. Mark Ruskell to be followed by Peter Chapman. Agency workers at Amazon in Dunfermline face withheld wages, unrealistic performance targets and hourly rates which are effectively below the minimum wage. This time last year, the First Minister welcomed Amazon's commitment to pay the living wage, but what action will she take this year to ensure that Amazon apply fair working practices to all staff? First Minister. We will continue uh, to press all uh, employers, including Amazon, uh, to use fair work practices around the living wage uh, and other uh, aspects of fair work. We have, as uh, the member will be aware, uh, made com commitments to our fair work uh, first policy uh, where in future government funding streams, uh, grants, investments, for example, uh, will be made uh, conditional on fair work practices uh, being followed. So this is extremely important. And my message to Amazon or any other employer is you wouldn't uh, be able to make the profits you make without the contribution of your workers. And it is essential that you treat your workers fairly. And Peter Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Last weekend, severe weather and flash flooding saw seven bridges destroyed in central Aberdeenshire and numerous roads damaged. I have spoken with a major vegetable producer who employs 100 people who has had access to his premises severely restricted as a result. And there are also numerous households in rural areas severely disadvantaged due to the road and bridge damage. I have been talking with Aberdeenshire Council's officials all week and the estimated cost of these repairs will run to millions of pounds. Can the First Minister commit to delivering extra funding to Aberdeenshire Council to help to rebuild, rebuild these bridges and repair the damage? First Minister. Uh, well, we will 
uh, continuing dialogue with Aberdeenshire Council, as we do with any council uh, who suffers from the kinds of uh, severe weather that uh, was suffered in Aberdeenshire last week. There are uh, recognised and well-used schemes in place, uh, but in addition to that, we have ongoing dialogue with councils and will seek to help uh, wherever we can. Uh, I know uh, how much of an impact the flash flooding had uh, and how much of that impact is still being felt, and we want to make sure that that impact is mitigated as soon as possible. Question number three, Willie Rennie. On Monday, I met Douglas Dawson at St Andrew's House Care Home. The local authorities have been unable to provide a care package so that he can go home. And he's been stuck there for 18 months. Now they want to charge him £26,000 for 24-hour care that he doesn't need in a care home that he doesn't want to live in. Mr Dawson told me this is a completely degrading way of dealing with someone who just wants to go home. Does the First Minister agree? First Minister. Yes, in, in general terms, I, I do agree. I, I agree strongly. Um, as Willie Rennie will appreciate, I, I don't know all the details of Mr Dawson's case. If he wants to share those with me and with the Health Secretary, I will look into uh, that as a, a matter of urgency. Uh, we've taken action in a range of ways from integrating health and social care to increasing uh, the, the funding uh, going specifically to social care to make sure uh, that we reduce delayed discharges and that people are in the care setting that is most appropriate to their needs. Sometimes, and I'm not saying this is the case with Mr Dawson, sometimes there will be particular circumstances that makes that particularly challenging. Uh, but the general principle is that people should be in the care setting that is right for them, and I'd be very happy to look into the particular case. Willie Rennie. But if the government had kept its bed-blocking promise four years ago, Mr Dawson would not be subject to this degrading treatment. And he is not alone. There have been two million unnecessary bed stays in Scottish hospitals since Scottish ministers promised to stop this practice completely. There is a home care crisis across the country and it is getting worse. In Fife alone, there are 400 people waiting for a care package. People in real need look to the government, listen to their promises and have been left waiting and abandoned. What do they have to do to get something done? First Minister. Well, as I said in my original answer, I, I don't know the circumstances of Mr Dawson's case, so I, I can't draw conclusions about what the reasons for that are. What Willie Rennie has described to me is not acceptable for any individual to be going through, but I uh, will look into that case. More generally, uh, we have over the last few years seen delayed discharges coming down overall. It remains a challenge. Uh, that's why we have integrated health and social care. It's why we're investing more funds specifically in social care. It's why uh, some of the other work around uh, waiting times, particularly in accident emergency is so important because these issues are so interconnected. We will continue to take the action uh, we need to take, as well, of course, as supporting and extending free personal care uh, for people who need it uh, in order that people, uh, everybody across Scotland, gets the care that they need and in the setting that they need. Um, and that's a commitment that is very important to me and to the government. Some further supplementaries. The first from Shona Robison. Is the uh, First Minister aware of the new uh, report Menu for Change out this week produced by Oxfam, Poverty Alliance and others which shows that Scots are being pushed into food insecurity by low wages, zero hours contracts and delays in receiving universal credit? Does the First Minister agree that social security safety net is failing to catch too many people? And what can the Scottish Government do to stop people becoming hungry in my constituency and throughout Scotland, including this place, taking full control over welfare policy? First Minister. Well, I absolutely agree that nobody should experience food insecurity in a country as prosperous as Scotland is. The report from Menu for Change this week highlights the impact of the UK government's punitive welfare changes and welfare cuts and we will continue to challenge those cuts and we will continue to call for a halt to universal credit which is clearly causing uh, so many of these problems. Uh, in addition to that, our £3.5 million Fair Food Fund supports dignified responses to food insecurity. And just last week, we announced an additional £1 million investment through the charity Fair Share to support community resilience 
to the impacts of Brexit on food insecurity uh, and the Scottish Welfare Fund provides vital support to those uh, needing access uh, to emergency funding to help with the cost of essentials uh, such as food and heating and since its start in 2013 over £200 million has been paid out to more than 330,000 households in crisis. So we will continue to do everything we can but as I say very often in this chamber until all of the powers over welfare lie in the hands of this government and not in the hands of governments at Westminster, we will continue to be doing this with one hand tied behind our back, and that is not acceptable. Yeah. Jenny Mara, to be followed by Andy Whiteman. Four years ago this week, the Parliament unanimous, unanimously voted for the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Act. Section 11 of that Act gives unaccompanied children the legal protection and support of the Scottish Guardianship Service. Make no mistake how important this is. Children trafficked into Scotland, many from Vietnam, with no idea where they are, no parent or guardian to look after them, are alone and extremely vulnerable to criminal gangs. Four years later, this protection has not been enacted by the Scottish Government. Why is that, First Minister? These children do not have the legal protection we passed into law for them. Will the First Minister commit to enacting this vital protection in full before Parliament breaks for Christmas? First Minister. Oh, right to Jenny Mara on that specific point uh, and be able to give her a full answer on why it's not enacted so far and the timescale for bringing that into force uh, because it is an important issue. More generally, uh, can I take the opportunity to commend and pay tribute to the work of the Scottish Guardianship Service. I uh, visited uh, some young people uh, who are under the care uh, and support of that service just a couple of weeks ago and I saw for myself the benefit to them of that. So we want to make sure that that service is available uh, to all young people who need it and we, I will make sure that Jenny Mara gets the specific answer to the question as quickly as possible. Andy Whiteman to be followed by Sandra White. Uh, thanks, Presiding Officer. I'm receiving a growing number of emails from constituents and Edinburgh solicitors in relation to flats in the city that can't be sold due to the attitude of lenders who are refusing to lend for properties with aluminium cladding. Surveyors are even giving home reports with zero valuation, meaning people are, uh, uh, people's homes are unsaleable. I'll be speaking with stakeholders next week. And can I ask the First Minister for her government's assistance in sorting out what appears to be a growing problem? I'm very happy to look into uh, this specific issue in more detail. Uh, we do want to make sure that we help in any way we can uh, with any homeowner who finds himself in this position. If Andy Whiteman wants to share uh, some of the evidence he's gathering from constituents with us, then the Housing Minister would be very happy to have a discussion to see what additional support the Scottish Government may be able to offer. Sandra White to be followed by Mark Griffin. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, First Minister, you'll be aware of the decision of the High Court today in regards to WASPI women and that they have unfortunately lost their case. Would the First Minister agree with me that the UK government must acknowledge the suffering and disadvantage caused through the transition period for these women? And would she also agree with me that a payment should be made by the UK government to all WASPI women? First Minister. <laughs> Well, can I thank Sandra White for raising this issue. I'm, uh, like many people, disappointed in the court judgment this morning, although it's entirely uh, a matter for the court. But these women shouldn't have to be in court uh, trying to protect what is theirs by right. Uh, the UK government have effectively robbed women of their pension entitlement, and it is absolutely disgraceful. So I would take the opportunity today uh, to call, like Sandra White is doing, on the UK government to reverse uh, this policy to give back to women what is rightfully theirs and to ease the suffering that so many women are experiencing because of this. When uh, people save for their pensions, uh, they have a right to expect that that's what they will get, not have it taken away from them uh, by a Tory uh, Westminster government. Uh, and it's particularly, um, I think, uh, worth pointing out that this is something that affects uh, women in particular. Uh, and that makes it, I think, even uh, more regrettable that these women are in that position. Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. Cummins UK are set to close their factory in Cumminald with the loss of 130 jobs after 30 years of loyal service by that community. Can I ask the First Minister if the Scottish Government will intervene, along with Unite the Union, to do everything possible to save those vital jobs? First Minister. Uh, well, as the Scottish Government always does in these circumstances, we will work with uh, 
a company uh, and certainly with trade unions to see whether there is any action we can reasonably take within the constraints we operate within uh, to try to save jobs and uh, save the, the company. Uh, that is always uh, the, the first step we take. If that doesn't prove possible and we're not yet at a stage where I, I can say that in this particular case, uh, we then bring to bear the resources of the government to try to help people find alternative employment. Uh, we are always interventionist uh, in these situations. Later on, I'm about to answer a question where I'll be making this very point, uh, that we always seek to intervene where we can. It won't always be possible, but uh, where it's not possible, we provide whatever help we can. Um, my thoughts are very much uh, with the workers in this case, because I know what a difficult time it will be for them at the moment. Question number four, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to reports that the number of police officers injured in attacks has risen by almost a third amid heightened sectarian and other tensions. First Minister. Nobody should be the victim of abuse or violence while at work. Attacks against our police officers are despicable and perpetrators must be dealt with in the strongest possible way. There is a wide range of powers available to tackle such crimes and we fully support the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service in dealing robustly with perpetrators. The Police and Fire Reform Act enables penalties of up to 12 months imprisonment, a £10,000 fine or both following conviction for offences against emergency services staff and we're also introducing restitution orders which is a new financial penalty that can oblige offenders to contribute to the cost of support services for police officers and staff who've been assaulted. Thank the First Minister for that comprehensive reply. Does she agree that the repeal of the offensive behaviour at football and threatening communications Scotland Act, driven through this parliament by the opposition parties, has sent a signal that behaviour considered unacceptable just a couple of years ago is somehow less reprehensible? And can the First Minister provide an update on what measures are being taken to enable police officers to work safely and help them respond to attacks in an appropriate, effective manner? First Minister. Well, yes, I agree with Kenny Gibson. Uh, I've consistently said that the repeal of the Act, in my opinion, sent entirely the wrong signal. Uh, the Scottish Government resisted repeal because no viable alternative was offered at that time. And as we have clearly seen since, the issue of sectarianism at football has not gone away. Repealing the Act, rather than seeking to strengthen it, took away important protections to help us address the issue, and we now have to deal with the consequences of this. Uh, the tactics used by Police Scotland to police events and parades are obviously an operational matter for the Chief Constable. Uh, however, I know that all police officers receive regular officer safety training, and all public order officers uh, receive additional training and have access to enhanced protective equipment. Question number five, Jamie Green. Uh, Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister whether she would provide an update on the £135 million in loans and investments that the Scottish Government has recently written off. First Minister. Uh, we published a full set of audited consolidated accounts for the financial year 2018-19 last week, including detailed disclosures on the value of the Government's loans and investments. Uh, our support for private companies has protected hundreds of jobs and ensured key economic infrastructure and business assets are preserved for future productive use. And we will continue to support companies and workforces facing challenges, not least those facing the dire economic consequences of a no-deal Brexit. Jamie Green. Uh, I thank the First Minister for responding and mentioning the government's accounts, because responding to the government's published accounts, the Auditor General for Scotland is quoted as saying, the government's financial reporting has taken a step backwards. Parliament needs better information to be able to better scrutinise Ministers' financial decision-making. First Minister, do you accept that writing off such large sums of money only adds to public spending pressures? And do you accept the Auditor-General's criticisms over your government's financial transparency and reporting? Yeah. Minister. Well, we will take uh, on board uh, all recommendations of the Auditor General around financial reporting. But on the issue of investments to protect and preserve jobs, I I'm afraid I take a different view uh, to that expressed by the Conservatives. Uh, these loans and investments uh, were made for the purposes of protecting vital businesses and jobs. Um, and I think it says a lot about the Tories that last week they described that as, and I'm quoting, a waste of money. And I do take a different view. This government, as I've just uh, set out earlier, uh, follows an active industrial policy and we are prepared to step in where action is required to safeguard industries and preserve jobs. Um, and I would have thought that Jamie Green, given the region he represents, would have welcomed the steps we've taken to support the workforces of Ferguson Marine at Port Glasgow and the staff of the former Texas Instruments plant in Greenock. 
These two interventions alone, we have safeguarded around 600 jobs in Inverclyde. <laughs> Jamie, Green, Jamie Green might think that is a waste of money. I think that's what governments should be doing. Stuart McMillan. Thank you, President Officer. President Officer, the loans to Fergus and Marine in Port Glasgow were important at the time and equally are so now. And does the First Minister agree with me that the decision by the Administrator and also the subsequent announcement yesterday is the only way that Fergus and Marine can safeguard jobs and build more ships, which provides the future that my constituents want to see for the yard? First Minister. Uh, yes, I, I do agree. The bottom line here is if the government hadn't acted in the way we had acted, uh, there would be no Ferguson Marine right now and none of those jobs would exist right now. Our action in bringing Ferguson's under public control has ensured that the jobs are protected, that the yard has stayed open and that much needed new ferries can be completed. Uh, the administrators, of course, have concluded that despite other bids being submitted for the yard, the government's offer presents the best outcome for creditors. So administrators are now in discussion with the government to agree final terms of a sale and expect this to be completed within the next four weeks. While we recognise there is still a lot more to be done, our actions have ensured that there will be a future for Ferguson's shipyard and that is the right action to have been taken. Rudy Grant. To ask the First Minister if she will now develop an industrial strategy to ensure that financial interventions in private companies secures the company's future, secures jobs and builds the Scottish economy. First That's Minister. exactly what we are doing and I, sh I should say, rightly in my view, uh, Labour regularly calls on us to step in. I've just had a Labour MSP today calling on us to step in in a, another case which we will consider doing as we always consider doing. It is not always possible for us to step in because all of these investment decisions have to be subject to proper due diligence and we have to be satisfied that we are acting within the law. So within those constraints, we will always take actions to save companies, uh, to give them a future and to protect the jobs uh, that are employed there. And I hope that even if the Tories think that is a waste of money, we will always have the support of Scottish Labour in doing things exactly like that. Question number six, Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to ensure young people can quickly access mental health services following reports that there were over 36,000 children and young people referred to CAMS last year. First Minister. Well, I think it's to be welcomed that the stigma around mental health is breaking down and that people are coming forward to get the help they need. Uh, we have demonstrated our commitment to supporting the mental well-being of children and young people, including through the £250 million commitment to support positive mental health for children and young people. We're taking measures to strengthen support available in communities, including the development of a national 24-7 crisis support service and provision of community wellbeing services. And we're building the capacity of schools to provide early support, ensuring that every secondary school will have access to a counselling service by next September and training an additional 250 school nurses by 2022. We're also working closely with NHS boards across Scotland to improve access to CAMS. Monica Lennon. I thank the First Minister for that answer. Earlier this year and soon after his GP explained that it would take a very long time to get a CAMS appointment, my constituent Kyle Stevens, who was just 14, completed suicide. His family are not looking to apportion blame, but they do want to make sure that no other family experiences the same painful and preventable loss. In the past year, 7,500 children and young people in Scotland were refused access to specialist mental health services and did not even make it onto a waiting list. We have no record of what support, if any, was offered. So after a year, um, so after a year of saying that it would, will the Scottish Government commit today to implementing the 29 recommendations set out in the Rejected Referrals Audit and put an end to children and young people being turned away from specialist mental health support when they need it most. First Minister. Well, can I uh, firstly uh, convey my deepest condolences to Kyle's uh, family. Um, in terms of the, the question, we are working to implement all of those recommendations and it's right that we do so. In terms of referrals to CAMS, uh, we see uh, the numbers of uh, 
referrals accepted, uh, increasing over uh, the last number of years. The number of referrals are increasing as well, but the numbers uh, accepted have increased. Uh, but Monica Lennon is absolutely right. Where a referral is rejected uh, and should only be rejected where the reason for that is legitimate, it is important that there are uh, good community uh, services available, which is why, as I said in my original answer, uh, we are investing in the community wellbeing service um, and the 24-7 crisis support and the uh, investment in counsellors and schools. I've said many times before that we must absolutely make sure that there is the access to CAMS that young people need. But often we have young people refer to CAMS because the community support is not there and it would be better that they access that community support. So building up the community service is just as important a part of this. And we are working uh, with considerable investment on all aspects uh, of that approach. Annie Wells. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In Glasgow, more than two in 10 children and young people are waiting longer than 18 weeks to be seen a figure actually worse than a year ago. On top of that, nearly 5% of patients in Glasgow had to wait anywhere between 36 and 52 weeks to receive treatment. When the SNP government made promises this time last year to radically overhaul mental health services, people expected to see it follow through. Instead of warm words, what urgent action will the First Minister take to support children and young people in Glasgow in need of this vital support? First Minister. Well, we will continue to implement the measures that we set out last year and that we are making progress in implementing. We are seeing more people coming forward for mental health support and that is a good thing and it is something we should welcome but we must build up the services to make sure that that increased demand can uh, be properly met. Uh, that means making sure that we invest more in CAMS services. Uh, we have seen in the last 12 years, CAMS staffing has increased by 76%. Uh, and it's important that we continue that investment. Uh, but it's also important that we build up the community services so that we have a much more preventative approach to mental health as well, which is why uh, we are prioritising the £250 million of investment, including the additional school counsellors and the community wellbeing services. These are all measures we set out last year in the programme for government and measures that we are implementing. Uh, and we will continue to focus on that and continue to make progress with it. And Gillian Martin. Could the First Minister provide an update on child and adolescent mental health referral waiting times in the Grampian area since the opening of the dedicated CAM centre in Aberdeen? First Minister. Uh, the dedicated facility for child and adolescent mental health in Aberdeen uh, officially opened yesterday, though the facility has been operational in advance of the official opening and the Scottish Government uh, provided £1 million uh, for the new unit. Uh, facilities like this one, uh, I think, are the future for child and adolescent mental health services. It has been purpose designed for children and young people with mental health issues and there are a number of different services available under one roof and having that coordination between services is absolutely crucial. Um, in terms of the next waiting times update for the quarter ending at September at 29, those statistics uh, are due to be published in early December. And question number seven, Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to tackle inequality between men and women in the diagnosis and treatment of heart attacks. First Minister. Uh, the Scottish Government is committed to ensuring that everyone, regardless of gender, has access to the best care and treatment. The report by the British Heart Foundation Scotland, which was published this week, Bias and Biology, raises really important issues about inequality between men and women in the diagnosis and treatment of heart disease. Our programme for government commits to establishing a women's health plan to reduce inequalities in health outcomes which affect women, uh, and that includes reducing inequalities related to cardiac disease. We work closely with the third sector, including the British Heart Foundation, as we develop that plan. Uh, we also, of course, continue to implement our heart disease improvement plan. The plan sets out the priorities and actions we will take to deliver improved prevention, treatment and care for all patients. Brian Whittle. Yeah, can I thank the First Minister for that answer? I think this Parliament is quite rightly proud of the work it does in highlighting issues with gender bias. However, as the First Minister stated, uh, research uh, funded by the British Heart Foundation and others has uncovered that at every stage, that is diagnosis, treatment and aftercare, women who have heart attacks receive poorer care than men. Underlying all of this is this common misconception that coronary heart disease and heart attacks is a man's disease. So uh, can the Scottish Government do, uh, what can the Scottish Government do in collaboration with organisations like the British Heart Foundation to tackle this dangerous misconception? 
First Minister. Well, I, I think this is a really important issue. And in some respects, uh, I think Scotland is probably slightly ahead of other countries in both recognising this and starting to tackle it. The British Heart Foundation uh, publication was an important contribution to this. It, supplements some of the research that was in the book by Caroline Criado Perez that was published recently as well. Uh, and there are many issues here, but uh, in particular, there is the issue which Brian Whittle has referred to, that often symptoms of heart attack manifest differently in women to men. But often uh, when we think of somebody having a heart attack, we think of the symptoms that men will uh, tend to have. There's also issues around some of the uh, treatments uh, will perhaps not be uh, tailored properly to women's uh, biology. So these are all big, big issues that I think the first step to tackling is making sure there is a proper and detailed and in-depth understanding. Um, and then through the actions that I've set out, particularly the Women's Health Plan, uh, be very systematic in how we're tackling that. This is something uh, that not only myself and the Health Secretary have a keen interest in, but our Chief Medical Officer uh, is leading the way on as well. And I'm sure it's something that Parliament will continue to take a very keen interest in. Thank you very much. And that concludes First Minister's questions. We're going to move on shortly to members' business in the name of Maurice Corrie on Great British Beach Clean. But we'll just, um, we'll actually suspend for a few minutes to allow members and uh, to change seats and also for new members to come into the public gallery. A short suspension.